That was more like 10 minutes, so my, I did not make good on my promise, but there was a good reason. Okay, so now we're at the point where we are at the talks. The first talk is uh, Eric. Um, what's new in 8.6.x? Um, from easier installation and more stable upgrades for the m technical teams to improved user experience for the marketing and content editor teams. Drupal 8.6.x provides significant improvements over all past versions of Drupal. Good, okay. Hi everybody. Um, I'm here to go over what's new in Drupal um, 8.6, as you can see from the title. All looks large enough, right? Okay, let's go to this one, let's try this. Good, start with table of contents. That looks large enough for everyone to read. Mike, okay. Does, does this look large enough for everyone to read? Good, okay, good. All right. Introduction, overview, media, quick start, out of the box demo, the Umami profile, migrate workspaces, layouts, even more improvements, what's next, and references. Okay, bit of an introduction, that's me. Um, I am now have nine years experience as a developer, which means that in 2009 I didn't know what any of this stuff was. PHP, MySQL, not a clue. Still don't, but you know, do my best. Right? There I am running a little bit. Uh, finishing another one of those, finishing another one of those crazy marathons. Uh, that happens to be in Duluth, Minnesota. Not quite as crazed on that one, just relieved. Ugh, marathon so far. Okay, I work at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, there are a couple of blurbs on them. Um, that's our T-shirt. You see people out in the park running with that. Pretty cool, I think. Okay, so overview. Drupal releases major updates twice per year in March, April, and also in September, October. Drupal 8.6 is a major update for September 2018. This update has been called the biggest update in Drupal 8's history. Uh, there are references in the back of the slide deck. Uh, Drupal is constantly evolving and innovating, and that's what I'm going to be demonstrating tonight. <coughs> let's, let's dive right in. So media. Okay, uh, we'll just do a quick definition on media that on, on an experimental module. As you can see here, experimental modules are not ready to, to use in production, but are ready to be tested out in development and sandbox, sandbox environment. But I tell you, media looks so cool, so good now, you're going to be, you might be tempted to start using it. But the APIs are not fixed, so that could be problematic for you down, down the line. But here, let's just do the quick demo. It's all going to be sc screenshots. Nothing's going to go wrong here. Okay, media. The media features have taken a huge step forward. Let's call it huge, not huge. Having media editing... <laughs> Having media editing work smoothly greatly improves the content editing experience. Better media management is often the most re requested feature by content editors. So I've done in my very quick poll. This isn't necessarily my space, but wa watch how this works. It works great. Okay, so what does media in core provide? Oh, let me reiterate, tonight we're just talking about features that are available in core. We're not going to look at any other, other modules. Okay. You can manage media, images, video, audio, etc., via an overview page, adding new media items directly without creating content. You can add media through a new media field and possibly through the WYSIWYG editor. I didn't find that feature. Maybe it's there, maybe it's still coming under implementation, but I, I couldn't quite find that. That's why I put it in italic and it's own little bullet. Okay, you can reuse media that's already been added to the site or upload new media. What do I mean? Okay, so we enable the media modules, all right? We go to the new tab, Admin Content Media, and we click the Add Media button. Okay, this is when it gets cool. Default media types, audio, files, images, remote video, YouTube, and video, local video. All of this is in core. Clicking a few more buttons, and now I have a media library. This is, a, this is Vimeo, this is a local video, this is YouTube, this is an image, this is a file, and this is an audio, right? Click, 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 media library. Okay, so now there's a media field, okay? So we all know how to, 
add fields. I didn't want to screen shoot that. That's too much in the weeds for an experienced group of developers such as ourselves or site builders. That's who this, this, this presentation is geared for, for site builders. Okay, you have a media field on your content type. Okay, this is, this is the change that you see, this media field set. Okay, no media items are selected. So when you click the browse media, there, it pops up. There's your media library. Okay, if we go back one step and you click the add media instead, you have th this field, which has numerous types of media that can be added. This is, hopefully that's large enough to see. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, everyone? Good. Yeah, I don't see a uh, video on, on, the, on, on this pop-up. I, I assume that's still, that's still coming. Okay. All right, so now, there you go, right? a node that has media from the library and media that has been added to the node. So as you can see from my notes here, okay, this, this piece here, this, this YouTube video comes from the media library and this file comes from the node itself, which is also now in your media library. Because I use the media, the, the media field to, to, to upload the, you know, to, to load it. So, so now this will be available, this, this file will be available elsewhere on your site. So anyway, I think that's, you know, that's really come a long way in terms of what we didn't have and what we do have now. But it is still experimental. When it's announced as stable, then start to migrate, <laughs> you, know, you know, everything. Okay, okay, uh, moving on. Okay, there's a quick start now in Drupal 8.6, which didn't exist previously. Drupal 8.6 comes with a quick start command that lets you install Drupal on your machine without a lot of prerequisites. We all know, but I'll read anyway. Prerequisites for installing Drupal include software like PHP, MySQL, Apache, Nginx, et cetera, configuring a VM, or finding a vendor that provides cloud hosting. Quick Start makes it really easy to test out Drupal. Okay, there's your Quick Start. This is a link to the evaluator guide. There's also a link in the references at the end of the deck tonight, but honestly, it's just these four commands. I took these four commands, okay? Oh, and by the way, um, I did a quick start with the demo umami uh, option. Um, I assume there's also a standard can go in here and probably also minimal. There's probably also a default. But uh, from the quick start, I just, you know, this was really, you know, this is a tour and we want to just get things down. So anyway, I grab these four lines, okay? Dump them into my command line, right? And this is what it looked like. Okay, within 15 seconds, right, from nowhere, Right, within 15 seconds, no more than 30 seconds, it pushed me into a browser window and, and there's my whole Drupal installation. That's all brand new. So, I mean, I don't think that a media, uh, marketing person necessarily would be the one who could follow these, these instructions, these instructions. But I think for a technical evaluator, right, no problem, right? You know? Okay, so that pushes us into the, you know, not, well, not push us, but it's a good segue into the out-of-the-box demo, which is the Umami profile. Um, you probably heard a little bit about that. Let's do some definitions here. The Umami install profile provides a demo of Drupal out-of-the-box. It provides the content, recipes, configuration, and the theme, including all resources like JavaScript, CSS images, and fonts for a fictional food magazine called Umami. Okay, when you install Drupal, you will now see Umami as an option on the install profile step. Okay, along with the quick start feature, the Umami profile will allow developers and site builders new to Drupal to easily test out and demo its features. One word of warning, Umami is really meant as a demonstration and cannot be used for starter kits. For new sites, future updates will not guarantee any backwards compatibility. Can I go on to the next thing? Yeah, there we are. So that's what it looks like. And let's look at it a little bit in a little bit more depth here. Very pretty, great deal of um, attention was paid to all of this. I, I wrote some patches for this. I mean, there were discussions about whether they should spell color with a U or with not a U, things like that. I mean, there's really a lot, a lot of really nice, nice things, and you get all of this for free. This is all brand new in Drupal 8.6. I'm assuming that everything that's used in this Umami uh, uh, out of the box demo site is uh, stable. You know, for instance, um, if we look at content on this, right, we see, well, uh, here's media. So media is not stable. I could, bu could build a media library. Okay. So, but anyway, you know, it's, you know, new. Something we didn't, ha we didn't have before, you know, some, some way, some way to, 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 sh to, to show off what Drupal does. 
Um, there are going to be views in here. Um, let's see, we got some taxonomies maybe. Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, and all of this is just from just from clicking a button when you do your install or or running the quick start with the um, umami profile. Okay, moving on. Migrate. Okay, Migrate has been a part of Drupal since uh, the first minor release of Drupal 8. Um, Migrate module allows you to pull content into Drupal 8 from previous versions of Drupal or external sources. Migrate is now a stable module, which means that it will be easier for developers to create custom migrations without worrying about API changes. Uh, this will also make it easier to write documentation and blog posts on how to do things with Migrate. You know, how do you do, how do, you do things with Drupal 8? It's not, not quite, the resources aren't quite as, quite as readily available as they were in like Drupal 7. You can find things pretty easily on the web, but Drupal 8 maybe not so easily. So that's, that's going to stabilize. We're going to see that stabilizing over the next year or so, I guess. Okay, one thing about Migrate, there's a Migrate Multilingual content is in a separate module, Migrate Drupal Multilingual. This module, the Migrate Drupal Multilingual module, is an experimental module as there's still some work to be done in this area. Okay, so I think I did a live demo of this when I, when I demoed what's new in Drupal 8.4. That was pretty brave. So right now it all works the same and it all works, but we're just gonna look, we're just gonna look at screenshots. Okay, so we enable the migrate modules. Okay, there's an upgrade page at this path slash upgrade. A lot of words for you to read on this page. Okay, migrate credentials page is the next one you're sent to. You know, you have a D7 site, you're migrating up to D8. Okay, one thing I didn't do when I demoed this in Drupal 8.4 was what about the contrib modules? So here are two Drupal 7 nodes. Um, and there's the five star on each of these, each of these, these um, um, content nodes. Okay, uh, progressing on with, with my migration back in Drupal 8, it's telling me that no, five star is not going to be upgraded. Not sure what that means. These 31 I assume are core. You'd have to look into it more carefully. Obviously when you're doing a migration, your uh, contrib modules can be really important. Um, Again, this is just click, 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 and then and then present present it to you. So I, I was just I was just curious to find out. This was something I didn't do when I when I presented this previously. So I wanted to know what does it do out of the box? Out of the box? Well, okay. So anyhow, all right. So then the migration runs, and I don't know if you can see this. This is a little small. Here's here's your con here's your content. Here's your content. Here's your content in Drupal 7, here's your content in Drupal 8. So yeah, I mean, my, Migrate is stable and, and it's working. You know, one thing about the migrations that, 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 that you will be um, developing is you'll be developing your own migration modules, obviously, that's how Migrate works, um, but you'll be, you'll be building that based on a stable API that's a part of core. Uh, like in Drupal 7, Migrate was a um, contrib module, the API was stable, but you know now this is the, this is what this is the space that, that Drupal is taking, right? So so you you know you've got all this great stuff happening. Okay, workspaces. This one I'm pretty excited about. Workspaces. What are they? Okay, workspace is an experimental module that allows a site administrator to create a new parallel version of a site's content, e.g., a staging workspace that can be deployed to the live site all at once. Workspaces continues the workflow initiative which brought us content moderation in Drupal 8.5. Content moderation provides a workflow for individual pieces of content. Workspaces allows entire sections of content to be moderated slash staged before publishing. Okay, so it's not, I'm not going to say that Workspaces is content moderation on steroids, but it's, 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 it's like looking at the entire your entire set of content and publishing that from one uh, uh, from one space to another. Here's a quick quick demo of how it works. Oh, and this is also I think this is so excellent that I thought it was worth putting this prototype in front of everyone. Um, this is a prototype. I think I first saw this in 2016. Um, I, um, I credit this here. This this was a, a blog post of Dries from 2000. Excuse me. I first saw this I think in 2016. This is a, a blog post that Dries published in 2017. Okay, I'm going to show this and I'll show you what's happening and how close uh, what we have in workspaces, um, how close it comes to actually realizing this prototype, which is, which, is its, which is its own accomplishment when you think about it. Okay, so workspaces, what do you do? Enable the module. Okay, so we're going to generate a little bit of content, you know, for the sake of demonstration purposes, we're just using develop, develop generate, 
Okay, so we've got some content on the site. Okay, so now we're going to switch to the stage workspace. Okay, so I have two workspaces up until this point. Okay. This is what you're getting out of the box, are the two workspaces, stage and live. Okay, so you, you're, when you enable the module, of course you're in the live stage, the live workspace. But I switched over to the stage. Okay. Okay, so I edited some content. Okay, so now there is a live content version of this content and there is a stage content version of this content. As you can see on this split, this sort of split screen, right, that this is for the, um, uh, what do they, they call it, the anonymous user? Okay, we still see the, the title in the Greeking text, okay? For the admin, the admin sees the, the edited content in, this, in the stage workspace. Okay, so now this is, this is when it gets really cool because you've got deploy content, right? Now, now of course, you can go to this path, uh, admin config, workflow workspaces, and you can click this button over here. This button, this, this, this whole um, user experience is available on any page on your site. Let me demonstrate. Okay, back to site. Okay, so I don't think I have anything to deploy, but I can be anywhere on the site, and it will tell me, yeah, there are no changes that can be deployed from stage to live. So we're just going to cancel here, but I think that, you know, this is, is you know, it's pretty, pretty close to what the prototype was, but was was promising two, three years ago. Okay. Um, okay. Deployed the content. Okay. So now I'm deploying the content. Back to back to my little sample here. Um, two items that can be deployed from stage to live. Let's do that. It's telling me exactly what's going to happen. Click the blue button. Successful deployment. We are still in the stage workspace. That makes sense to me, right? I didn't change my workspace. All I did was send my two pieces of content that were in stage up to live. And yes, indeed, you know, it's happened, right? On, on my anonymous user, right, sees the, the content change, and I also see the content change. You know, the, the admin also sees the content change. <coughs> oh, um, that's all I have to say about this. Workspaces is still experimental. Um, I mentioned later on in, in this that there is still some conflict management that needs to be done. Um, different users working on the same content, um, all that has to be justified, you know, has to be righted, you know, be before this content is, is available to be deployed from one workspace to another. Okay, layouts. All right, so I'm going to demo, demo this. I think that this is import, an important part of the, Dru the, uh, the Drupal ecosystem. I know in this room we have people who never go near a front end on the Drupal side of things or never even expect Drupal to be a front end tool. Um, but layouts is a part of the ecosystem and I'll do the slides and then I'll show you why. Okay. So layouts, Drupal layout is still, this is still experimental. This one's a little rougher around the edges than what I've shown uh, uh, up until now, which was uh, media, which is still experimental, which I think is very close to finish because it feels very finished. Um, and uh, workspaces, which feels very finished, but, it's, but the last piece, the, um, I didn't do any conflict, res conflict management in uh, workspaces. I don't know what happens there, maybe bad things, you know. So we, ha we have to wait and see on workspaces. But layouts, layouts, and I'll show you why this feels a little rougher around the edges. Okay, how do you do it? <clears throat> okay, enable some modules. This one should be clicked as well. These two, these two have this one as a, as a requirement. I just didn't get that in the this, in this screenshot. So three modules enabled. Okay. Um, okay, so now we go to structure contents, okay, uh, content types, edit a content type and click manage display. There's a new tab here. I thought this was, I guess you'd be expecting layout builder to be enabled by default. I suppose that's an expectation. All this is going to be configuration management, which can be, which can be changed um, to, to the um, uh, site builder's uh, preferences. All right, so Check allow, oh, here on this one, we're going to also check this other one, allow each content item to have its layout customized. Okay? Save and then click manage the layout buttons. I guess we're, we're jumping a little bit back and forth. Um, anyway, I ended up here, manage the layout button. I guess I could use a screenshot for that. Anyhow, I'm sent up to the front of the site where you control the layout for this content type. Click add section and you'll be able to choose from one column, two column, and other options. 
note the uh, what was happening over here with the uh, system tray. Um, we have that as well. Let's see, I probably have this here. Okay, so what did I say? Structure, content types. Oh, this was in this was in the display. Okay, save. Okay, manage layout. There's my button. Oh, here we are. Oh, where is it? No. Nope. It was here the other day. Oh, here we are. Save layout. No. Hmm. Okay. So anyway, to to system tray is used. Okay, I found it the other day. Didn't find it today. Okay. Okay. After adding a two-column layout, I have this new grouping of boxes here. Okay. All right. Click add block, and you'll be able to choose from almost all the data on your site. So add block is, is not necessarily a finished expression, right? Because you're not adding blocks. You're adding fields, user data, forms, views, and more. Okay, and he, here's, the, here's where, where I, think, I think it puts layouts into the Drupal ecosystem, th this slide, because layouts can be used for media, contact forms, taxonomy, users, and more. I kind of already said that. Okay, in WordPress, some folks feel that the Gutenberg editor is a good idea with poor execution. This new Drupal layout editor is closer to a full page designer like WordPress's Beaver Builder or Elementor than it is to Gutenberg. I don't know what any of those three things are. I mean, I might have looked them up in the Google, right? And it's like, okay, those things exist and they have WordPress on them. But when you think about this, right, you're going to want to see, I mean, someone is going, someone in, in working in Drupal is going to want to see a layout builder that, that they can just work with. Right, they don't have to think about, I mean, they have to know a few steps, but they'll just, they'll just go ahead and they'll just set up a layout, right? The requirement of something like this, of course, for us developing it is that it works with configuration management, that everything works, and so forth and so on. This looked very primitive, relatively fundamental. You know, I work for, I worked on front-end typesetting systems, then I worked on Quark Express, then I worked on InDesign, then I, then I worked on the, on the Creative Suite, the Adobe Creative Suite. And I tell you, by the time we got to the Adobe Creative Suite, you didn't need a technologist there. All you needed was the creative services folks to do that. That's what this space is about. This isn't about, like, your uh, decoupled or, I mean, I think. This isn't about what your decoupled is or what um, um, Pattern Lab or all the other really fancy things that are going on in the front end. This is about a tool that, that, that is still to be imagined in, in its own way. And that's where, that's where I think Layouts fits into our ecosystem. Okay, even more improvements, yay! Okay, the process of porting tests to simple test to, from simple test to PHP unit is almost done. Nightwatch.js was allowed to, to, was allowed, was added to allow for automated JavaScript testing. Okay, somebody's gonna get something good out of Nightwatch, right? What's next, <laughs> right? <laughs> New features for Drupal 8.7, as, as, I'm, as I'm sure many people here heard, there's support for JSON API and core. Uh, potentially a refresh of the default admin theme 7, potentially conflict management, because that's marked as Drupal 8.7 plus, potentially conflict management and local workspace merging support, work on features like automatic upgrades. No one wants to go through um, their, their Drupal 9 upgrade the way we all went through our Drupal 7 to 8 upgrades. Okay, more what's next. Drupal 8.7 is scheduled for release in, Drupal, in May 1st, 2019. Watch the latest Dries note from, from Drupal Europe for an overview of the Drupal roadmap and new develops, developments that are in the works. These are all the references for everything I referred to. Thank you, questions. Are there any questions? I'll do my best to answer them. Huh? I'll take this one for right now and then I'll hand it back to you. Um, question, do you know if the, the layout editor will work with workspaces? For example, is it, are you able to stage your layouts? Have you tried those together before? Okay. I honestly don't know the answer to that. See, see, seems like, seems like it, all the pieces should, should work, you know, easier said than done.
workspace just for content or does it also like modules, you know, if you want to stage? I believe it's just anything? part of content. Just content. So yeah. you can't, okay. Yeah, that's more of a con that's more of a configuration management issue, you know which modules are enabled when. Workspaces totally relies on revisions. Like you have to be able to have like content that's in revision states in draft. So right now only nodes. Like there's a challenge in court because taxonomy terms are not revisionable, and so as they're going to gradually evolve. Media is because we they started building it. They're like, okay, we need to know that we can do that. Contrib modules, probably none of them, very few are doing revisions. And then there's issues like views. Config entities don't support revisions at all. So like views, that, that's technical, but like views doesn't support revisions. It has like a temporary staging workspace and that's it. Okay. Thank you all. Managing the upgrade of their sites, pushing from staging to live. Does workspace in any way interfere with that, or mm. do they work together? No, I think I think we're talking about two different things. So, so it's a it's a Drupal database and a Drupal code base. Right. So this so this would be the database, which of course you would never want to store on GitHub, even though databases can be downloaded to a file. You you wouldn't want to do that because you'll have secure information in there. Right, so content goes into the database and then and, and then code. Yeah, no, no. Okay. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Da -da -da. Next up is Jacob talking about advanced web forms. I probably don't need to read the sentence again. I think we I think you'll elaborate. Cool. One thing. I'm just going to see if I can adjust the display overall and see if I can make it a little bigger. If I can't, let's try. It. Much better. Is that uh, as big as it can get? Is what I want. That's all good. Put this up. Oh, still good. Sorry. All right, that's it. We're done. Um, let me make sure my back and forth. All right, so just a little. This is. I've done a lot of web form presentations. I'm trying to do an advanced web form presentation so that people can get the most out of web forms because I think it's fairly intuitive to go in and build a simple contact form, but when you want to kind of address very specific client needs, you need to start understanding the APIs and how things are structured. Um, my goal is to, you know, do this presentation for DrupalCon, I definitely need some feedback, because something that happened with DrupalCon this year for anyone doing presentations is now there's either 30 minute presentations or 90 minutes. And there's no way to talk about an advanced presentation in 30 minutes, and 90 minutes is a long time. So I have to kind of, and this is not a 90 minute presentation, I promise. This is probably closer to a 45 or 50, and I have to figure out how I might deal with the other 30 minutes. I'm definitely, I'm, there's no way I'm doing a 90 minute presentation without a break in the middle, so I'm going to try to figure out how to add more material and segment it. And I'll, I'll show you there's a point where I want to kind of talk about that, where I'm thinking I might have to add more material, and maybe I'll come to the next meetup and do a 30 minute presentation. 
But this is a technical presentation. I'm going to start off and just say, you know, my name's Jake Brockowitz. Um, I talk really loud, so I'm not going to hold the mic because it's a little easier to just do a demo and I will just speak loud and if the mic picks it up, great. Um, I'm known as Jay Rockowitz on the web. I'm a Drupal developer and software architect and I built and maintain the web form module for Drupal 8. And so kind of my pitch on this is, you know, building advanced web form requires leveraging hooks, understanding plugins, building render arrays and writing tests. And it's just kind of the general topics I want to go into. But for people who aren't familiar, I want to just do kind of web form 101, just the basics, like my elevator pitch and what the module does and walk through the UI so that as I'm going through the concept, the concepts, we have some visual context on what features I'm talking about. Um, so the elevator pitch is, you know, the web form module is a powerful and flexible open source form builder and submission manager for Drupal 8. And I like to describe it as it provides all the features expected from an enterprise proprietary form builder combined with the flexibility and openness of Drupal. So you get a lot of features out of the box, but then you can customize the heck out of the features and do whatever you want. I mean, it's not just that you can look at the source code, is there's hooks, plugins, and ways to customize things. And, and the use case, and I've included this in almost every slide I've done on the web form module, is, you know, you're going to build a form or copy a template, publish that form as a page note or block, collect some submissions, send out a confirmation email, review those results, those submissions as they come in, and then distribute those results as a CSV or remote post. And it's really a three-step process. You're building a form, you're collecting data, and then you're distributing the data. And, and for this presentation, I added this slide to talk kind of about the workflow, which is similar to the use case, but it's more like as a developer, the steps that you're going to take when you're building a form. So yes, you're building a form, you're going to add elements, you might edit the source, which I'm going to actually demo, but then we're kind of talking about configuring it, the settings, setting up handlers. Handlers are ways to send data, like set up email, test the form, publish the form, view the results, export those submissions, and then alter behaviors. And that's where we get into kind of APIs. Um, I'm going to do this demo of just the web form module from the UI. I'm going to walk through all these different steps. I'm not going to break these down. I'm kind of doing these to remind me of all the things I want to show you, which is a lot. And this is going from the beginning to the back. Uh, I'm going to jump over. And something about this demo, which I've never really done in any of them, is I'm actually have my devel mode turned on for my demo, so you're seeing everything I use to maintain the web form module. And the most immediate thing you should notice is there's 203 web forms that I use to test things, and I will get into that. But for now, for the demo, I'm going to jump just to the contact form. And I've done this a lot of times. It's like my elevator pitch for the web form module. We've got a simple contact form, and all I want to do for the demo is show you how to add a, a company field. I go into the UI, and I add a text field. And I'm going to call it company. And all, most of the features turned off. I'm going to hit save. Add it. And you can see that the company field. Sorry. Wait. Is that at the bottom? And, and in this demo, I make a deliberate mistake where I'm basically saying, ah, it doesn't say your company should be required. It should be under your name. And it gives me an opportunity to show you that there's a source mode where you can go in and edit the raw source code behind the form. I'm going to fully explain what this is, but for now, I'll just show you me literally moving company up, changing your, your company. I want to make it required. I just love showing cut and paste because it really gets powerful when you're building complex forms. And I'm going to hit save. And now I'm going to jump to the test tab, which is, just shows you the form and just automatically fills it out with dummy data so you can quickly just hit send. This is a very simple confirmation. It just displays a, a message at the top of your home page. And so we've kind of gone through the process that we built the form, we have a form, we've had someone submit the form. Now I'm going to just show you the data coming in. And there's that single submission. You can click through, review that submission. You can actually view it in different ways as a table. You can edit that submission afterwards. Um, I'm going to jump back up to the results. And then after you review, review this, you can download this data by clicking the Download tab and selecting a format. The easiest one to show you is I'm just going to generate an HTML table, and there's this little button here that will stop it from downloading this, which would open it in a spreadsheet. And I'll hit Download. It'll just show you online this table being generated. And of course, there's a lot more data. This would open up in Excel, and you could style it. And click back. So this has been, I've just showed you from the beginning to the end of the web form module in terms of that use case. The only other thing I kind of want to just quickly show you 
it's just settings. There's a lot of settings, and I have a lot of presentations where I go through all the different options of setting up drafts and previews. But I just want to walk through, you know, so this just give you a quick lay of the land where you can say use something as a template and keep going. But what I really want to show you is handlers because I'm going to get to them. So in the background, when I submitted that form, an email went out, a confirmation and notification email went out, and this is just the UI to manage those things. And I think people are kind of familiar with these properties. It's just, you know, who's the email going to? Is it CCing someone? What's the subject line? How's the body being formatted? And go back. And keep going. So that's like the elevator pitch. Now, throughout this presentation, I'm going to have additional resources. So if you need more information about something, you can click through the slide. And it's available at bit.ly, advanced dash web forms to look at the full slides, and that's in the beginning, and I'll even go back to the beginning at the end so you can get that URL. Um, but there's a whole list of features, which are, it's a little outdated, but it shows you all the features available. I'm definitely updating that before DrupalCon, so there'll be a comprehensive feature list with screenshots of everything that's available on the Webflow module. And in that section, there's a bunch of articles about the Webflow module, people writing about it, people showing how they're doing custom handlers for integrations with like MailChimp, and there's, a a lot of videos walking through each step of the Webflow module. Even as I was going through it, I'll just point out that there's videos as you click through to different things. So if I go to templates, which I'm not even going to talk about, there's a video here that can give you more information about it. And a quick note about the video, it includes resources at the bottom to help you understand more about the general details behind the Webflow module. Okay. So I'm doing something really different here. I'm trying to do a presentation where I don't put all the hard stuff at the end or the boring stuff at the end. I'm trying to jump around so that people who don't understand complex things will get something out of it, and people that do understand it will get it. And I decided to start with testing, because I always feel like that's the thing that everyone leaves to the end, and even a lot of presentations they forget to do. They're like, oh, ran out of time. And I just can't do that, because I think it's one of the most important things. I mean, with the success of the web form module, it has a lot to do with good testing, and not that I'm doing like crazy stuff with testing, I'm just making sure to test everything and have automated testing. I want to walk through some of the concepts that I've kind of learned along the way. And I really, this is my favorite slide in my whole deck because it's very simple. This is my concept of testing. Test confirm expectations. Looking at all this complex stuff with BHAT that everyone does and all these different ways to do it, night watch, you need to boil it down to the most important thing. You need to write something down that documents what your expectations are so that you know it works. Even if it's a piece of paper that says, I go to a page, I click a submit button, and I get this result, that's a valid test that confirms an expectation. That's not the end of the world, and sometimes you have to do that. But it's just thinking simply that you're, you're documenting this stuff, and you, you kind of know your expectations and what you want to be achieved, when you're, even when you're writing a feature. Um, so the web form, with web form test, I kind of bucket it in these five concepts is, you know, I check the rendering of something. How is an element going to look? And then, you know, we have an input, so we want to check the processing. That's like the default value. How is it going to be populated? And then when someone hits submit, what's the validation? How is that going to work? Are email addresses being validated correctly? And then, you know, everything has all these little nuanced settings in the web form module, whether drafts are enabled, whether there's input masks. So there's some tests to just check those settings, those little kind of, it's, it's like settings and behaviors. And the last one, five, is like one of the most important things to have automated tests, and I personally hate writing them, but you have to, is checking your access controls to make sure that, you know, users with the right permissions can do the right behaviors, and users who shouldn't be able to do things can't. And you need to check those, because if you make any changes, you don't want to accidentally expose like an administrative field to a anonymous user. Um, so some of the best practices I've had with the web form module is you can create test modules in Drupal. You can, and they're hidden, and your, your general users won't see them, but when you go into settings.php and say, show the, these test modules, you, you can build these kind of like test modules that are features, and they'll turn on and build out an entire feature set, and then you can run automated tests on that feature set. It helps a huge amount because you can get it into configuration. Um, Writing tests for every element setting is kind of a big picture, like component-driven design is this concept in design. You want to break things down into small chunks that you can kind of manipulate, review, and test. 
and even in when you're building complex systems like the web form module, just realize that every, literally every single element, there's like 80 elements, has a single dedicated form with a single dedicated test that just reviews that single element. So if there's a bug, I can get right to the problem. And even, you know, as a developer, you can go in and look at those, you can actually load a form and say, show me all the email elements, and you can review that element and see that it's working. Um, and you, it's important when you're writing a lot of tests to look for repeatable patterns. Um, the best example I have in my test framework for the web form module is I have a, a helper function called post submission. And all it does is take one argument, a web form, and it looks at that web form and it figures out the right way to generate a submission on the fly. Like, you know, it's pretty simple. It just looks at, okay, what's the submit button label and how do I use Drupal's test bot to generate a test submission and it returns a submission ID. It's like a little enhancement. Um, the other thing is organizing tests. If you have a lot of them, you have to think about how you're going to group them. I mean, people do read, it's not that they do read tests, it's they have to navigate through them to figure out what's going on, so it's good to use subdirectories. Um, I want to emphasize, having easy to repeat manual tests, personally, I think is okay. I have no very minimal JavaScript tests, but I do have forms that will, I will enable the form and it will set up like, for example, like the date picker element, so I can just manually test the JavaScript and know that it's working. And it's quick. Someone says there's an issue, I can immediately start examining that issue with that test form. And some tests are better than no tests. I cannot emphasize that enough. Is my, be my personal best practice is everything gets a test, even if it's as stupid as did this stupid field render with nothing else? So that at some point when something breaks, I know I can go into the test and start adding and improving it. But it's just a good start to have something. And yeah, this is kind of the breakdown um, I've looked at. And this kind of gives you a good overview of a lot of the features of the web form module. It's like testing how forms work, wizards, how elements work, composites, which I'll explain. Then you get into behaviors, configurations, and settings. And you know, you kind of want to, when you start adding plugins to your code, you want to test your individual plugins. And Handlers and exporters, which I'm going to fully explain, have their kind of own set of tests and their own directory. And then when I get into integrations, because you can place web forms on nodes and in blocks, I make sure to have tests dedicated to that. And finally, you do want to check your APIs. Hooks, token, if you do any token work, you want to check that. Um, I have some tests for the libraries, because there's a lot of libraries for the web form module to make sure they're going to work. And, and by the way, the, the web form module still uses deprecated simple tests. I haven't had time to port them, but you should only write PHP unit tests if you're writing tests. And they're very similar, but you should start in that direction. Um, I'm going to do a quick overview of some of the tests and show you some of how it's structured. Um, from the UI, it's, I, I mentioned that there are 203 forms here. And I, I've kind of realized, instead of showing an element, it's kind of good to show this concept that there are dozens of ways, you know, not a dozen, there's like seven ways to do different types of confirmations to your form. For example, someone hits submit, you could redirect to an external URL. Where they hit submit, you give them a dedicated page, or you can have it pop open a modal dialog. And every one of these conditions has a dedicated form to test this, like a specific type of confirmation. A good example that I just mentioned was the modal. And it's a very simple, stupid form. It just has a text field just so it'll render. And then when I hit submit, it pop open some modal dialog, and I have tests to just confirm that this is going to happen. I don't have tests to confirm that the JavaScript fires, but I have tests to confirm like how to, the, the JavaScript that I'm looking for to fire gets rendered. And it's a good starting point, because if I run into a bug with this, I can go back into that single form, look at it, diagnose it, go into the test, and, and check it. Um, from a coding perspective, with confirmations, if I go into, and since I'm in doing simple tests, it's in this directory, I'm, it's very hard, this left sidebar, it's kind of hard to read, so I'll walk you through some of it. It's an SRC directory, it's in a test directory, and then I have settings, and if I go over here, go to confirmation, and by the way, these are helpers that are written. These are all those confirmation forms that I just mentioned before. They all get loaded. With a, I'm extending a web form test base class, so it kind of helps move things along when I'm writing tests. And each one of these confirmations are checked. Confirmation message, and I think modal will be down. Let's see. We'll see if I, by the way, this is a good example. If I don't have a test for modal, I still have a manual test for how modal dialogues work, which helps, I can't emphasize how much that's helped along the way. Um, 
every element, and you're going to see a massive directory, has dedicated tests to it. So when, and you, when you start building custom elements, you should write dedicated tests for your elements. Um, and a good example would be email. I have an email multiple value where you can enter email addresses with commas separating it. Um, and look, this is all it's doing. It's checking that it renders correctly. When someone submits an email address, it validates it. Not valid, throws an error. Um, these are good examples of where to start. And you should copy some of these tests when you start building out your own models. Um, oh, and very quickly, just the directory of test modules. You can have configuration of them. So in this one directory, there's the 203 web forms that are loaded to do testing. I don't load them when I run my tests. I load only the ones that are needed. But then you can create mini little test module that test hooks and behaviors and handlers and, you know, isolating those little functions so that, I mean, one that's in here that's really important is test translation and test Lingotech. I don't actually use these in any automated way, but when someone has a problem with Lingotech integration, I can turn on that module and get some baseline config to quickly look at the, try to replicate their issue. I'm gonna keep going. These are some resources. There's documentation on Drupal.org. Drupalize Me does a really good job of documenting, you know, testing best practices, how to set up automation. But now we're going to get into some more specifics to web form. So web form entities. Um, step back, stepping back, everything in Drupal is an entity or a plugin. I mean, that's really how I view it. And the description, which is from Drupal.org, you know, any defined chunk of data in Drupal is kind of an entity. Includes things like nodes, users, taxonomy terms, files, contributed modules like the web form module can have custom entities, and entity types can have multiple bundles. That really just means that like your nodes can have content types. So uh, a node is an entity, but a bundle is like a page article. And, and just and I will give the definition of plugins as we move on, but just think of entities as collecting data. I mean plugins are behaviors, and we'll get into that. This is a web form entity, what we just looked at. And when we get to the submission, it's a web form submission entity. They're two separate things. And about web form entities, and I, I can't dive down this rabbit hole, but I came up with two key words to be like, web forms are config entities. That means they're exportable into files, kind of defined as configuration. Submissions are content entities. They're stored in the database, they're data. Um, and both those terms you can look up and there's a lot of documentation to help you understand and distinguish those. Important thing to add is Webforms doesn't use field API. Um, it actually, submissions use something called the entity attribute value model. I'm not even going to read this whole description, but the key thing about, uh, I'll give people two seconds to be like, the key thing about entity attribute value mo model allows you to store a lot of data, massive amounts of arbitrary data quickly. Um, it's a simple way to store a lot of and I just wanted to walk through some of the table design because it just, it helps me illustrate a, a more important concept in the next few slides. But look, this is a web form submission. It's stored in the database. These are general properties. The top two, I think you could kind of get the submission ID or the web form ID. That's like the unique ID that we're going to store. And, you know, generally, when was it created tokens? Now, the entity attribute value model is stored over here in the web form submission data table. And I think this slide helps just illustrate the concept. So the first two, so there's only six fields to this table. The first two is the entity. What is it? It's a web form ID with a submission ID. The attribute is what, what type of data you're storing. And for web forms, there's three pieces. It's the name of the element. If you have an address element, you have properties. So you have the city, state, and zip code. Those become properties. If you're storing multiple values, those become deltas. And after that's established, all you're storing is a value. And all values are stored as plain text. Um, it makes it very easy to store this data. It limits some things with views and searching, but we can get into that in a separate presentation. Um, the demo here is really simple. My goal is just to illustrate conceptually the difference between config entity and content entity in relation to web formats and submissions. And I'm going to use the Devel module. I strongly, this is a wonderful module because even for demos like this, I can go over to entity, I can type web form and it will show you all the web entities that the web form module is providing. There's some extra ones I'm not going to go into, but you can see the web form entities here. There's a Devel tab. Let you inspect it. If using PHP Storm, it's better to go into PHP Storm and look at the inter like to inspect the code. But this is a good starting point. 
and shows you the submission. But what's more important, I'm going to go back to, give me a second. And if you're an admin user and you have the ability to import and export config, there's this tab called export. And people are familiar with configuration export. This is nothing new, but this is a web form being exported. And it just shows you how it's set up. It shows you all the properties. And it just lays it out in code. And you can actually click here and download it and move it, the single file, from one server to another. If you need help in the web form module and you have a broken form, you can click export and attach this to an issue queue a ticket in the issue queue and it makes a big difference. Um, in that test tab, if you turn on the web form develop module, there's an API tab now. And the API tab shows you how to programmatically create a web form submission which is stored in the database. And it just kind of illustrates the simplicity of what a web form submission is. It's a couple of properties and then the data that's going in. And this is just showing you in YAML what the values might be. And this just gives you a PHP example of how you could create a submission programmatically. It's really for people doing API integration or importing data. Um, some more references to kind of walk through entities and get familiar. What, what are Drupal entities? We'll definitely explain those two differences of what a content entity and config entity. It really helps understand a lot of concepts in Drupal when you can grasp, you know, one's in the database and one's, in YAML. one's kind of in YAML would be the best way to put it. So this is a big concept that I need everyone to understand when you're really trying to work with the web form module, this concept of a source entity. And a source entity tracks and creates a relationship to the Drupal entity from which a web form was submitted. And it, it, it allows you to take a web form and attach it to multiple entities on your site and reuse it. Um, you can take a web form and attach it to events. And the same registration form can go to 100 events and it will track the data for each one of those events. The best comparison in Drupal speak would be comments. So you have a comment form that's attached to multiple blog posts, and when someone submits a comment on that blog post, it only tracks that comment in that one space. And it's a ref there's a reference on that comment to the specific blog post. Um, in the web form module, there's two mechanisms to determine source entity. You can look, it looks at the route or the query string. So you can, it will look at the web form, if you're on a node URL, it'll look at that and be like, the node is the source entity of the web form. But you can also pass query string parameters, which is you know, source underscore entity type equals node, and you can pass the ID with it. And everything's using this source entity concept. So web form nodes is driven off that concept. When you create a block and place it on your site, it will track where it's being submitted from, and even paragraphs start to track source entities. And going back to that example of the web form submission table, these two fields is what's tracking it. It's an entity type and entity ID. Type meaning node, ID meaning the ID of the node, and if it was a user, it would track entity type of the user, and it would be the user ID. And when you're in the UI, you get the submitted to column when the source entity is kicking in, they get populated, and you start seeing it tracking through. And what this allows you to do is create things like site feedback, like comments. So you can have a feedback form that appears on every page of your site, and you'll know exactly where they are when they're providing feedback. Event registration. You can have a, a registration form attached to your events. Application evaluation is a pretty complex use case, but it's a really juicy one for colleges. It's where you have an application that comes in, it's a web form, it generates a submission, and then you can attach a web form to that submission where people are doing evaluations on that submission. So you can get feedback on that application, and people have done that pattern. Um, this is actually, and people could talk to me on the side, I'm feeling like this is, for my advanced presentation, the first part that I might do is walk through building some of these applications for a half hour and so that people get more familiar with the user interface and all the configuration settings required to set these up. Um, there is demo modules that include the configuration for these. Talk to me more after, but. Um, with the demo here, I just want to walk through creating a web form node really quickly to kind of show that relationship and then I'll just show the plugins and. It's a great intro. These plugins are some of the best introductions to plugins because they're ridiculously simple. Um, if I go into this contact form and I click this references tab, it's finding that there's a web form node and it's just going to click over and it's pop. It's creating a web form node for people who are familiar. Node add web form. I'm passing this ID and I'm generating a dedicated web form node for this contact form. And if I click submit, I can use the test tab. 
it's capturing results only for this instance. So if I go to the results tab, I'm only going to see one record. If I jump all the way back up to manage structure, and I go back here, you're going to see there's two results. And if I click through, so this first submission came from the default generic web form, so there's no source entity because it's itself, but it's tracking that it was submitted from a web form node. Now, jumping to this plugin, what's great about this, and I will give you a definition of plugins, but for now, just think of plugins as a snippet of code that does something. Um, I think that's okay to start with. But we go in the plugin directory, and we go to source entity, and we talk about route. This is a ridiculously simple plugin, and I'll just show you the interface for it, which is just clicking up here. It has one method, get source entity. So all this plugin's purpose is to do is to determine what the source entity is based on the context. And if you go to the route parameter, without diving too deep in the code, it just looks at the current route and tries to figure out what's the entity on this route. It's just looping through the, the they're called parameters. What what's being stored, and it tries to find it and figures out if there's a node. The query string one is just as simple, where it's just looking at the query string, looking for these custom properties, uh, uh, um, custom query string parameters. Source any type, source any ID. It actually checks if those are valid. Very simple plugins. Um, most people aren't creating these plugins because this is the two common use cases. Commerce module might be adding one of these plugins to the web form module to deal with their custom use case for I think it's a shopping cart. I'm going to keep going. Oh, and yeah, you should look at the web form node module for some concepts of how it's set up, but um, I think it's more important just to look at the plugins. And so now we're going to step back even further and just talk about forms, just building forms, which is understanding form API. And, you know, web forms are render arrays which contain elements that build, validate, and submit form values using Drupal's form API. It's very, the web form module is an extension of Drupal's form API. And Drupal's form API is just an API to build forms. I mean, um, and to step a little further back, render arrays, I just want to give a definition of what a render array is. It's the basic building blocks of Drupal content. Everything you see on the page in code is a render array. And it just describes what's going to be output. And, you know, Drupal's form API, you know, just a, a breakdown of it is like, it really deals with elements, form elements, and it's anything that's displayed on a page. An input is an element that just collects data. Um, you know, Drupal form, Drupal's form API doesn't heavily use composites, but a composite's a group of elements. The best example in core is radio buttons and checkboxes. That's a composite element, because each one of those individual checkboxes is an input. And a form is really just a collection of elements and inputs. That's all that a form, when you're getting a form that's rendered, that's what's driving it. And yeah, this is a form. And what I really want to show you, okay, this is a contact form. Four fields, four elements. What describes this contact form is this render array, which we looked at before the source code. And it just breaks down into elements with properties. This is as YAML. And in core, people use PHP, and it's the same form we're talking about in PHP. Same thing, title, type. And, you know, Keep in mind, forms are really simple. They build, validate, and submit. That's what forms do. That's all you need to think about when you start customizing forms. And this demo is really simple because really everything under configuration is a form in Drupal. This is a good starting point to look at forms and understand what people are doing. So if you go to the system, this is one of the most basic forms, basic site setup. And you can look at this render array and understand how it's set up and how, what they're doing with it. And they do very minimal validation on this. Um, and to, to further illustrate it, what I want to do is jump to the form interface. For anyone getting new digging into code, you must look at interfaces. They're your friend. Because this is the interface for forms. If you started to figure out form effect, and when you start reading it, you're like, there's four required methods. The idea of the form, how the form's built, how it's validated, and how it's submitted. And that helps you to understand everything that's going, any form you look at, it's going to have those four methods, and then they're going to kind of go off and extend them and do their thing with it. Um, with this, I also pointed out, this is going to the examples module in Drupal.org. There's a dedicated module. It's like Drupal.org. If you type Drupal examples, you'll get this module. and includes examples of every single API in Drupal, how to build forms with examples, 
with full documentation. It's a great starting point. Basically how I would how to work with Drupal. And some more references. There's Form API Docs on Drupal. I am a fan of Drupal Eisner. It is worth getting a subscription. They have really good, solid material, especially if you're starting out. And now getting into form elements. I mean, form elements are defined using a render array, which we've defined, which is processed using a render element plugin. And now we're really going to dive deeper into plugins, which creates an element, an input on a form. And plugins are small pieces of functionality that are swappable. And you know, the, the three big things to think about when you look at plugins is they're reusable, they're standardized, they ha always have a defined interface annotation on how they should be set up, and they're extendable. So you can take an existing plugin and extend it and make minor tweaks if you don't like how something's working. Um, yeah, so form elements are plugins. I think it's really important that render array goes into a plugin that then processes it. And form elements just extend standard render elements. So that's because they can take an input, but on Drupal site, an example of a render element just it would be the messages displayed at the top of the page. It's a render element. It's called status messages. Um, and just a little note about elements is, you know, they have properties that begin with a hash, and every element in forms, a really important one, must have a key. And this is just a breakdown of an individual form element. Maybe it's a little pointer here. There we go. Um, this is the key, the name. We've kind of gone into this. This property defines the title, what type of input we're going to want, a text field. And these are some arbitrary, there's some attributes being added. And these attributes just go into the HTML markup. So style, a class. Now if I click forward, we're going to see that this is the rendered element. And this is the rendered markup. And you're going to see, for example, the background color kicked in, the class kicked in, it generated, took the type, and, you know, generated this type equals text field text and got the label. And one important thing I like to point out is what's beautiful about Drupal is that's little markup here generated all of this. This little code generated all this with all these great defaults like max lengths and sizes. You can customize those on your own too. So with the form element plugin when you're looking at it, I just wanted to kind of illustrate just not all of these methods are required and I'm kind of giving you just abstract examples but this idea that Form element plugins need you to define the properties, what, what it's looking for, how it sets an input value, what's the default value, how it's going to build that input, how's it going to render it, what are the custom little features, and when it gets down to it, how it's going to process, that means bringing all those things together and kind of finalizing it, and then rendering is right happens, and you don't have to implement all these methods, but these are all available depending on the complexity of your input. Rendering is like right before it's going to go out to the browser. What's going to happen? Um, a lot of times it just sets attributes. and says, okay, I'm generating a text field and these are the attributes I'm looking for. And a big one that if you're doing web forms is validation of your elements. Because if you're doing custom elements, a lot of cases you're going to want some custom validation callbacks um, just to check the data. I see people, you know, people generate an address field, they're going to want to check that it's a valid address. And so just some quick tips with form elements is copy and extend existing elements. Always do that. It's just Rarely you need to start from scratch. You can either extend something existing or literally copy a text field and be like, I'm going to make my own version of a text field and use that as a starting point. This is a very tricky nuance one to just point out, but element validate is the only way to alter a submitted value. It doesn't happen much in core, but I've gotten caught by it a lot. Meaning when someone submits a, a form and you have an element, that data comes in, and sometimes you want to manipulate the data. Uh, an example in core is there's an email confirmation field. It has two, you have two email addresses, and it's confirming that they're equal, but what gets stored in the database is only that single email address. And that processing to figure out is it valid, but then to say, okay, we only want one email address to be passed to the server, like to, to Drupal, that happens in the validation. It's a really important nuance when you start looking around. You'll see the pattern, you have to just pay attention to it. And then if you have composite elements, that's a bunch of inputs working together, you must use this property called tree. And what it does is it takes all those inputs and puts them into a little associative array and passes that around. If you don't do that, the data goes all over the place. So you'll see tree a lot in form elements because you have to group these things together. So the demo I'm going to show is really, I love the develop module. If you're starting with any concept in Drupal, it's so helpful to use the develop module to be like, well, what's the concept, what's Devel showing me about it? 
And Devel just shows you every element that's available. Raw, simple, like here's the list. Um, if I type text field, it'll say here's the text field, here's where it's located. And I actually use that for an example. I'm going to close this. There's a couple of instances of text field, but I'm going to go to core render elements. And what I, I like about this demo is, so this is a text field, a simple text box. What's nice about this is it's 100 lines of code. And it does a lot. And it has a lot of documentation to say how you, you know, it gives you examples, shows you the properties that are expected, how values, this is a really interesting nuance I don't think many people know happens in core, is if you have carriage returns in your default value, core strips those out. It's a good, it actually is a savior for people that make that mistake or somehow, you know, you're pulling data from an external system that has returns in it. It just strips them out and converts it to spaces. Otherwise, you lose the data. Um, and then this is that classic render. It's really simple. It's basically saying, okay, what's the type of input we're going to put out? And what are the attributes we're expecting? And this last one is that, that classic form class that you want on every input so you can style it, which is form text. Um, moving forward. More documentation to look at. Um, definitely go through all... This one is, a, uh, the Drupal API one is a big one because it shows you every form element with API documentation that you can read on the web, so you don't have to go through the code. So this is a little weird. I've just walked you through form elements and now I'm saying creating web form elements. And this is a tricky concept, but I needed to start very simple and be like, form elements, I'm creating a text field. Well, web form elements are wrappers that enhance Drupal form elements. So you are required, and this is the next slide, it requires Web form elements require a corresponding form element. So in the web form module, there's a text field, and in core, there's a text field. And both plugins must have the same ID, meaning like pound type equals text field. And what the web form element plugin does is it just enhances the, the heck out of a simple text field. It adds all these custom behaviors. It does, it creates a configuration form. It allows you to control how things are going to be displayed when it's submitted. And when you start getting into these web form element plugins, there's some stuff, there's base classes to help you organize related elements. Um, an example, in core they don't have this, but in web form there's a text, an abstract text-based plugin. And it just defines how text fields are going to work. Because there's more than one instance of text fields in even HTML5 in core. It's like, you have a simple text field, but you also have email addresses, URL, passwords. They all kind of work like text fields. When they're rendered, they're slightly different but they share a lot of commonality. So the web form module goes after that to try to capture that commonality in one space and make it easier for you to create a simple text field of your own. Um, yeah, base classes just help organize related elements. And I also use traits occasionally. Traits are ways of taking a bunch of functions and push, putting them off to the side. Um, in the web form module, the best example would be there's a lot of entity references. That's like you create an element that references a node. And there's a trait just to capture some common behaviors that can't really go into a base class because entity references are kind of floating in a lot of different spaces in the web form module because it's a couple of different instances of it. I don't use traits often. It's better to do a base class, but once again, just an overview. This is similar to what we just talked about with form elements, but we're starting to get into that space of what's going on with web forms. You got to define the default property. Web forms relies heavily on default, so it makes it easier for people to build a, a they can just say, I want a text field, here's the title, and it generates it. It has reasonable defaults to get them going. And then there's helpers to start preparing that element. If you're starting to code it, prepare means like, it's kind of like an alter hook. What else do we need, needs to happen? If, if you have input masks, which is available in web forms, how do we get those in, input masks attached to the text field? And then the behaviors is just kind of helpers to figure out, is this a multiple value element? Um, Oh my God, is it a container? Is it a composite? These are just little helper methods, and this will help you. You know, you can go in and customize how they're going, working. And web forms includes this nuance. You have the form element, but when you get the data, you have to kind of control how it's displayed. So you have submission values, how you're going to build the HTML display of that element. And something that's not really easily available in core is every element can be built as HTML or plain text, because we need plain text to go to systems like email or to send SMS messages, so you kind of need those two different formatting options available right next to each other. If you're exporting the data, there's a, a method to 
prepare that data to be exported into a spreadsheet. And finally, what we've seen in the UI is a configuration form. And the demo here, let's see if I can tighten this up a little bit. I can. Um, so web form also includes, if I go over to here, similar to what Devel is doing, but I'm tracking, if I go over here, here's an admin view of every single web form plugin that's available. And this is very verbose. It's really for developers to kind of look at the lay of the land. And if I went over to text fields, since we keep sticking to that, you can see, you know, general summary, but it also shows you, oh, this is process text, sorry. Just shows you the class hierarchy, that text-based class, and then there's a default web form element base, which is a huge class that kind of contains a lot of default functionality. This is those properties, like behaviors. Is it hidden? Can it be hidden? Is it a composite? Can it support multiple values? Um, is it deprecated? And then these are all the possible properties that can be added to it. And finally, at the end, there's this little test tab. And you don't have to use this, but it gives you a good, quick way by the way, this goes back to the concept. Isolate your components. Break them down so you can test them and know what the hell is going on. And that's what this does. This is just a test form for text fields. And go in and look at the configuration and go in here and add. Let's just show one feature as an example there. Input hiding. I just added it. I'm going to just show it to you and then I'll explain it. Hit test. Shows you that input hiding is there. So what input hiding does is, let's say you have a kiosk and you have text fields and you don't want to show that value until someone's entering it. Just so it makes it possible that when someone focuses, you show them the value, and when they exit, you hide the value. It's a really simple behavior, but this isn't available in core. It's a web form module feature. Um, you can go in, test it. You can also just build a form to test these elements, but just I've learned the lesson. You gotta break things down and make sure to test it. Um, to get started, just to jump on code, I want to just go to the web form element interface, and you'll see this is a massive interface with a lot of documentation. When I say massive, it's just got a lot of methods. Like, it's 800 lines with full API docs, and it's just showing you everything that you might expect. I'm going to make this bigger. But it shows you the grouping. Property methods, get translated properties. You tend not to have to customize these. Um, the base element is, is gigantic because it's trying to set up your reasonable defaults, your methods that you would expect to be there. And what I want to do is jump to text field and just show you that point to illustrate it. Text field is not that big. It is 40 lines of code because all the other classes are kind of setting things up properly. And you can go in here and add your own custom functionality, your own text field. Um, it's literally just turning on saying, yeah, I'd like to do input mask and input hiding. And you know what? There's a counter available, and it turns on the counter. Um, you can actually go in and swap out the default behavior of this text field because it's a plugin. Plugins are swappable. And the final thing with this is there's example modules included in the web form module. If I go to example element, this is basically a skeleton of everything you would need to build your own custom element. Everything I just talked about is included in this one module. Just to point out, it includes a config entity that just generates a simple form with the example element that we are, that's included in the module so you can go test it. And if you go in here, you've got your element that we've just talked about. And this is fairly, sorry about that, fairly simple. and gives you just like placeholders to work off of. Shows you the pl corresponding plugin. Includes an automated test just to show you, and this is very simple, what I just talked about. It's Actually, this is maybe not enough test coverage, but it's enough to get started. It's just confirming the element rendered on the page. Um, and that's it. And you can use these to just copy and get yourself started. There's also an example of a composite element, which is a group of elements working together. Um, good way to get, I personally start everything with copying other people's code. Or use um, console to generate skeletons, and I think both those are valid approaches. Drupal console is just a command line tool to basically generate, I, I go with generate skeletons of different features in Drupal, like a module. So, yeah, I kind of walked through this in this, um, when I was just showing it to you, but with creating custom elements, you got to create a module, extend or copy an existing form element plugin, always create the form element first. 
you can actually test, create that test web form and put that form element on the page and not have a web form element plugin. You can just say, here's a text field and see how it looks. Then you gotta define that web form element plugin, test the integration, and ultimately always write tests. So we're gonna switch gears, because now we're getting into kind of the, one of the more, some people need custom elements, and then some people need a way to route their data to custom places, and that's where handlers kick in. And handlers are plugins used to route submitted data to applications and send email notifications. And these are web form handlers. This is the, that's in the settings, kind of what I wanted to hit at before. There's only a few included in the web form module. Um, some alter behaviors. The remote post is really common, and I, there's demos of that, but basically it takes your data and posts it to a remote server, like Salesforce. Um, and then there's email handlers, where you can kind of send an email. And this one that's being shown here is the scheduled email handler, which allows you to send emails in a scheduled time. So you could say, for event registration, it's great. Someone registers, and you say, send them a reminder to a day before the event. And it schedules it and tracks it and takes care of that. And yeah, this is just a very simple, we, I wanted to show it to you live, but this is the email handler. And Webform handler plugins, you know, this is an important thing about this plugin. Handler's plugins are just like hooks. All it does is have these, the interface and the methods are just like to capture different behaviors and do different things, like to capture when a form's submitted, to, cap, to even alter a form when they go to a confirmation page, to maybe tweak the confirmation. Um, yeah, and in those methods, you can react to the submission state, because submissions go through different states. Just keep in mind, like, you can, the example of the states is, well, it's new. If someone saves a draft, they're saving a draft that's not completed. Maybe then the, once they hit submit, that's in a completed state, and then if an admin goes in and updates that submission, that's an updated state. Something to keep in mind when you're building handlers, because you can react to those different states. And generally, most people should use completed. That makes the most sense. You get your data, you put it off to your remote server. The update one's useful if you're syncing to your remote server. So if an admin was to go in and change some data, you might want to sync it. Something people just need to always be aware of with handlers is they support conditional logics. It's not a programmatic thing. Not something you do in pro, you do it in the UI. But you can kind of have your handlers email sent out conditionally based on different properties of the form or behaviors or even the time of day. Um, so this, what I'm walking through here with the methods on it, you're gonna see they're very corresponding to hooks and plugins. So it's like, yes, you have to define the configuration of the handler, like emails, the who's it going to. You can also, there's this, this method I included because it's an important one, is you can actually have a handler override behaviors in a web form. Um, what would be a good example? Your, you can have a handler override the confirmation page's URL dynamically. So based on the submission, you could calculate where you want to redirect the user to and go in and say, that, okay, web form, I want you to go to this other URL and on the fly tell the web form to redirect someone. I mean, literally, you can encapsulate all your business logic in one plugin. That's really the goal of handlers. Um, and that brings up, you can alter the form as it's going out. You can alter individual elements. It also exposes every single entity operation related to a web form submission in the handler, so you don't have to write hooks, which we're gonna to get to. I kind of left the simplest for last. Um, but you can have a post save in your handler. You can react to after a web form submission saved, and then you can you know, update the data. And it even acts on when elements are created or even, even other handlers are created, so it kind of tracks every, every behavior that's happening around your web form is sitting in that handler plugin. And the admin view for this is a lot simpler than the element one because it's really just listing out some minor details about each handler. Um, for developers, there's documentation on it, but the two that I think are worth calling out is you can control cardinality of the handler. Um, a great example is emails you're gonna wanna have, you could have unlimited emails sent out from a web form submission. But the, the debug handler, which just shows the data that's being submitted, really should only be added once to a web form. So that cardinality allows you to kind of control that. Um, if you have a custom handler doing a lot of stuff, you probably want to set the cardinality to one because you don't want to have someone accidentally execute it twice. Um, and then this little other nuance, and this is a juicy one, is like 
you know, you, web form submissions don't have to be stored in the database. So you can say that you can have a handler that says this handler requires a database submission, this handler doesn't require a database submission. Um, and that's a, a, a little nuance, but it's helpful to know that that's possible. Um, by the way, I think that those are more, if you're building your own custom ones, you don't have to worry too much. If you're doing it in contrib, you want to pay attention to this. Um, I'm going to just show you, there also, okay, I'm going to show two more things from code. I'm going to, since I'm here, I'm going to go to the last thing first is there's an example of a handler and there's a module showing it to you. It's a ridiculously simple handler and just shows you what this actually is doing is taking every method and if you turn on debugging, it just displays a message that this, this method is executed so you kind of can get the idea of how the handler is going to work. And you'll know, okay, override settings executes right when a web form's loading. Um, and the only other feature of this is it displays a message on the screen. So this is a good starting point. It also shows the couple of things are required. The one thing that is required, if you want to display information about the handler, you have to define a template. That's like, okay, this is all the configuration settings. And I mean, this one is two lines of code. Um, with the plugin, and I think this also illustrates the importance of looking at the interface. Um, and just for non-technical people, interfaces is just like a definition of how something's supposed to work. It doesn't really contain any code, it just says people are coding, it gives them a guideline. It says this is what we're expecting you to do. And if they don't implement certain aspects of that interface, it'll throw an error, um, which helps a lot. I'm going to go back up to here. Handler interface. You're going to see some of the constants that are, you know, required, unlimited, ignored, and then we're going to get right into, these are just some of the settings, but then you start getting into things that people are really familiar with, like alter elements, override settings, alter form, validate form, submit form. So you can have a handler capture all these things. The reason I did this is it gets everything in one place. You should be able to do everything you need to your form in a handler without any problem and have it like copy, pasteable, extendable, makes, and that's why plugins are the new hooks. Um, moving ahead, yeah, covered enough. So, getting to the kind of the last plugin, and this is a pretty minor one that I think just people need to know exists. It's extending web form exporters. And, you know, web form exporter plugins are used to download submissions into spreadsheets and other applications. And when you're on that export form, there's that export format, and that's exactly where these plugins are kicking in. So when you say I want a table, this is the plugin that's going to generate the table. And export a plugin overview, you know, this is a cardinal rule. Always extend an existing web form exporter if you're doing anything with it, because I can't imagine you coming up with a new type of data format to export. You might want to change how it's going to go to Excel and tweak it, but you should extend, there, there's like a base table exporter that you should extend and work off of. You could start from scratch, by the way, because you'll see when you start looking at the code, it's not that complex, but conceptually, I mean, I, most people are basically extending the, the delimited web form exporter which generates CSV files. And what they use it for when they extend it is to add custom data to it. Um, and a little note about exporters, and this isn't really about APIs, is Drush has commands to automate this. So you can have on the command line generating spreadsheets and sending those out to people. And you can see it's getting simpler and simpler because an exporter plugin's got like three things going on. Some configuration settings, it's going to basically write data, and it has some hooks to do some file naming. So if you're generating like, if you're exporting files, it'll just generate some base file names. And this is very easy to demo. So we're still here on the exporters. These are the the, the four that are included to, you know, dump just own files. I'm going to stick to the table exporter because people understand HTML tables. Um, there's not much going on here. You can see even it gets simpler and simpler. But if I jump to the exporter for a table, this is a real, I'm going to make it bigger and just say, as one setting, whether this table should be opened in Excel, this is the form, a checkbox to determine it. And then it's just writing a header, literally table header tags, and the header generates the HTML markup around it. And to export your data, it's just the TDs. And 
going into a table. And you, I mean, my point of showing this to you, if you want to get really fancy with your clients, you can go extend this and build incredibly stylized custom tables with logos and fancy things, and they will open in Excel, and you're just dealing with standard HTML markup. And a little stepping back. So Excel and Google will consume HTML tables without any problem. They look at the table and they just convert it to a spreadsheet. Um, and it makes it where you can do really pretty things. So we're getting to the end here. I saved hooks for last because hooks are real, for me, like hooks are old school now. Um, hooks are functions that define or alter behaviors. Very similar to a lot of stuff we talked about with plugins. You know, uh, the handler plugin to be specific. Handlers and hooks are just really similar. They're both just acting, they're altering behaviors that are happening in Drupal. Um, the nuance to handlers is you build a handler, it's attached to a single form, it acts on that single form. That is a big limitation of handlers. Like, it, you have to build it and attach it to a form and then it kicks in. Hooks, a lot of hooks can be applied to all forms. You can define a hook, which is just a function, to alter giant behaviors. Every single web form, you can define a hook and tweak it, form alter hook. And it's important because we talked about web forms are entities. So all entity hooks are applicable to web forms. So you can use these, en like, entity hooks, I gotta just, okay. I realize I have a mistake here because I'm just not showing you what a hook is. You know, I'm talking very abstract. So I'm gonna jump ahead a little faster and come back just to be like, what is an entity hook? Because I think it's important. But really, to step back, plugins are the new hooks in Jubilee. Generally, people say, use plugins. Or, by the way, there's a term called event subscribers, which I'm not getting into. But hooks are still around and they still serve a purpose. And there's just these little functions that you can go and tweak simple things. And I'm going to add a demo of a form, a form alter hook to this. But for now, I'm just going to say it's a function. It's just like you can alter a form. These are some common ones. And I'm just showing alter hooks because I think people kind of just need some references. So you can alter the form. You can alter an individual element. We didn't get into select menu options, but you can alter a drop-down menu. That list can be dynamic. You can actually have use that hook to go out to a remote server and grab a list of options and populate it. The last one, this, this one at the bottom, which I'll use my little pointer here, is inc I added it recently. It's kind of a ridiculous power hook that I have yet to use. So think of it this way. You have a web form, and, oops, sorry. and someone hits submit, and that submit button triggers a hook. It invokes the hook, it, it, not hook, it invokes the email handler. This hook allows you to capture any single invoc invocation of any handler on your site. So you can go, and the example someone had was like they're doing remote posts and they wanted to be able to tweak the URL of the remote post dynamically, and this hook allows you to do that, to get right before any handler on your site's executed, you can go alter what's gonna happen. Um, it has a lot of use cases, and it was a pretty lightweight hook to add, but I personally haven't used it yet. It's kind of a funny one that I added, and I was like, uh, we'll see. Um, but I want to emphasize, entity hooks, these all are available, so you can just tweak how a web form submission saved, or, you know, trigger things, or how it's deleted. If you have data on a remote server, when that submission's deleted, you might want to go out to that remote server. And there's more hooks available, like you can define your own libraries, external libraries, if you want to leverage the web form module, which I didn't get into supports a lot of external libraries, and that API is available to you to use. You could say this is an external library, and it'll, there's actually a Drush command that will go out and manage that library for you. Um, and yes, even access rules are alterable. And there is a dedicated web form API PHP file. It actually is easy to show, because I can just go right here. And every good module will have this file, and it basically documents all the hooks that you would expect. Um, and there's some I haven't even talked about, but it gives you this idea that you can alter a specific element type on how it's rendered. So, we're at the end. So, I include a lot of resources. These are just some more personal ones. You can connect with me on my blog, drupal.org, on Twitter. With the web form for help and support, uh, I'm leaning towards saying Drupal Slack is the first place you should go and say, I got this problem. And 50-50, well, it's 50-50, someone's going to say, well, no, all right, let's do 30-30. 30% of the time, someone's going to be like, I know the answer, here you go. Uh, the other 30%, someone's going to say, post it on Drupal Answers, and then the other 30%, you'll get ignored. But 
it's, not, it's at least someone's going to respond, and you know someone read it. If I tend to read them and try to respond. Drupal Answers is a great way to post your questions. People are pretty active on there. Uh, the web form issue queue is really for, if you find a bug, I will help you. General support questions, I'm trying to steer people away from the issue queue because it gets harder and harder to maintain the module. Okay, thank you. That's Ralph, he says, thanks. Uh, any questions? A lot of information. All right. So thank you for your work on this module. Um, one of the things I've always wanted to do, especially if you have a site that's submitting a lot of content, you may not want it to go into the database directly. Um, have you been doing like sending it to Cassandra or Mongo or Elastic or something like that? Yeah. Um, well, you'd have to. Yeah, and I mean, I'm totally cool with doing a quick, literally demo of this to just point out. Yes, you can do it. There's really two setting, two things you have to kind of take into consideration. You have to turn off the saving of results, and I definitely recommend people take this feature into consideration a lot because this means the data never sits on your server just goes into Drupal, this process, and you have to have a handler, and it displays a lot of warnings, but it doesn't sit on your server, which deals with a lot of compliance issues. So if you say, disable the saving of submissions, it'll kick in. And the reason I'm not getting an error here is because I have emails going out, and you can go create uh, the, for when you're talking about Cassandra remote systems, I mean, generally all these remote systems have APIs, so, what people are doing very frequently is they use the remote post handler. And what this does is it just, you go in and enter the URL, your API. Um, you can say when, and by the way, these are all that, the states. When a web form is completed, updated, deleted, it could be all the same URL, it could not be. Then you get control over what data is being passed. By default, it just passes the data being submitted. And a very tricky one, but it's really important, because when you talk about like Cassandra and these other APIs, you can go in and tweak the headers. So you can pass authentication keys and kind of sort these out. Because that's a little tricky with authentication. I can't figure out the best way to tell you, you know, can't cover every authentication process in one single handler. Um, going back to extending existing handlers, a lot of people extend this handler and then they put their layer of OAuth authentication that they need on top of it. So that right before the remote post is happening, they can get the authentication key and pass it into the header. Is that Good enough? But uh, you wouldn't be able to view the documents here after that. Yeah, that's true. Um, well, we just added like really good views integration into the web form module, and views actually support scanning remote data. If you, I, I, I don't know in Drupal 8 if that's happened fully yet, but I know in 7 it was like brilliant, where it could go out and use a web service and display data that's not in Drupal, data that's somewhere else in the ether. And you can go and replace every one of those default. Anytime you see a list in the web form module of submissions, you can go and replace that with any custom view that you want. And it actually tries to help you give some default views for you to get started with. Other questions? Hey, um, hello. No. Um, thank you for your work. Um, I've used your web forms for another application. Um, just curious. I use a lot of com composite forms for your application, and yeah. there's certain forms that are not available. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if it's just because the complexity behind it, or is this just not, you're still working on it? Like the file upload is kind of one example I could give you. Of? Of a, we having a composite form. You mean a composite form meaning taking two or three forms and combining them into right. one. Um, it is really complex. And, and it's not like Drupal's form API is like very happy with that concept. Um, I don't even, it has no concept of that. I mean, composite elements, so you can kind of, if you're building your own, you're getting into the code and you're writing your own elements, you can kind of build a composite element that acts like a composite form and you can merge them together. But to create another form and embed it, I, I'm not gonna do it. Um, it gets really complex and it's risky. I got the part I have, I have an issue with it is um, data integration, in, 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 integrity. Sorry, just on it. It's just like, because if you have three forms coming together and someone changes something, how does that affect all the data coming in? Um, I tend to recommend using composite elements. Like, that's the way to go if you want to kind of get more modular with your forms. Um, and I also, it's cut and paste, you know, what I like is you can cut and 
paste from one form to another. So you can kind of have snippets. You'd be like, okay, here's my standard, you know, widget and put it in place. So. Any other questions or are we good? This is long. Back again. Fine. Um, I, not sure if this played on your question, but sort of two sides of it, like, a lot of these questions are like removing Drupal from the equation, but uh, could I like embed these things on some other website? Um, and then also, is there a way to like just post and get the validation in like through an API and I yeah. can control the front end myself? Um, the, the benefit of the web form module is it's kind of tightly coupled with Drupal and from the rendering perspective, like all those features and widgets. And there's really right now no way, and I don't think in web form 5.x that's going to happen, but people are going in the direction of headless. They are doing headless web forms. Like there's literally a web form react module on GitHub. So what they're using, they're using the UI to get the complexity, you know, to manage the configuration, but then they're using the web form rest API. There's a web form rest module and they're taking that configuration, pushing it out to react and collecting the data and sending it back. And that's what that, this API tab on, let me see if I can, form general, I hate when this happens here, but let's see if I can get back to the test tab. This is a quick illustration of the API and people have other helpers, like the REST module, the Webform REST module offers a REST endpoint. This is just showing you, I mean literally taking this data array and then how you validate it and submit the values. So, and it still processes it through form API, so you, all your like form auto hooks kick in. But completely decoupled, it just didn't have, you know. I, I think what's gonna happen, by the way, a little note there, Drupal's gotta decouple its forms, and then web form module's gonna follow suit and figure that out along the way. We good? You can stop me in the bar. Thanks, guys. Bar, but there may be something else. Let's see if there's something really important here. Um, yeah, come back. That's this next slide. It's basically come back. The next meetup is next month um, on the 7th. And, uh, oh, right. Just another reminder that not only are we looking for people who might want to give a presentation, it could be as long as Jacob's and as in depth. It could be a lot shorter. It really, really can be whatever. But also, looking for people to help organize. So, you don't have to be a developer to help organize, you can just want to do it. Um, and uh, I honestly don't know what that was. Is this one the old Denver? Oh, just come. Yeah, come back. Um, so, yeah, see you downstairs. If you don't know where this place is, just follow the, the sea of people who are going to get free alcohol. I will mention one thing. Um, yeah, I will mention one thing. There have been, at these after parties in the past, there have been orders of food. That is no longer cool. You can order non-alcoholic drinks, but you cannot order food in the, I mean, you can order food yourself, but that is not covered in the after party tab. Just a little note, drink your hearts away, eat if you want to pay for it, but we'll see you down there. Thank you. order non-alcoholic drinks, but you cannot order food in the, I mean, you can order food yourself, but that is not covered in the after party tab. Just a little note, drink your hearts away, eat if you want to pay for it, but we'll see you down there.